Beyond the plans is the next level. <clears throat> when we first started out, we had the civil service computerization program, but actually we didn't know, have anybody who knew how to do IT. So uh, one of my uh, uh, sponsor uh, agencies uh, at the National University of Singapore was set up by 16 people we borrowed from IBM. Of course, the institute today is run all by Singaporeans, but at that time when we first started, nobody knew how to do IT. Our first uh, gentleman who ran our IT company was from Hong Kong. And the government sent a whole bunch of people overseas, myself included, uh, to the US, to the UK, to learn computer science because we didn't have a computer science program in Singapore when we first started, right? So uh, it started, not all, of, not all of us made it back from the US. So I have many friends uh, in Google, in uh, Bell Labs, uh, who were Singaporeans, but uh, went with me to study, but didn't make it back to Singapore. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I think they still contribute to uh, what we have achieved um, uh, by sharing with us their experience overseas. But actually implementing e-government it's not just about the technology, it's also about the process. There's a joke, old IT joke that says, uh, to air is human, uh, to really screw up, you need a computer, right? Uh, and, and it's true. So an example, two years ago, um, the Ministry of Education overpaid uh, about 2,000 teachers about an extra month and a half salary. They discovered that error three months later and ask the teachers for the money back. Yeah, right, you know, they're gonna get the money back. Teachers say, no, we spent it all, right? How are we gonna get back the money? You paid us a, a month and us extra salary, but we spent it all. Now you're gonna come and claim it back. Why do I raise the example? Because, you see, if the checks were made out by hand, this probably wouldn't have happened. You would have made an error on one check. Today, if you make an error, you make an error on 2,000 checks, 3,000 checks, 5,000 checks, the whole, uh, uh, scheme of uh, things has changed. And therefore, um, the way we do work, where we put our controls, that, that differs. If you've never done it with computers before and now you're changing into comp uh, using computers, that actually changes, the way you work changes. The other thing is that people implement IT, but you see, if IT makes things more efficient and you had a thousand people in your agency, you bring in computers and now from a thousand people, you need 700 people. What are you going to do with the 300 people? What are you going to do with them? Have you planned that beforehand? How are you going to redeploy them? Will there be new jobs created? Absolutely, the new jobs will be created. They'll be created in IT. How do you then convert these people uh, into IT people? Right. So there's a reskilling uh, that's involved. So there's, a, there's that skill. How do you go about reconfiguring your organization, transforming your organization, planning for different job assignments for this, for, for your government uh, as you go ahead. The second big skill is this thing about getting different government agencies to talk together. It's hard enough without IT. Wait till you want to get them to get their IT systems to the future. That's hard too. And of course, um, uh, in other countries, uh, when I speak to the Chinese uh, city provincial officials, they say that, look, those coastal cities, the coastal provinces, they are wealthy, and so they invest a lot in IT but the inland provinces are less so, and you can't wait for everybody to ha reach the same level of development. So what happens is that you have lots and lots of different pieces of IT systems that no longer talk to each other. So to what extent do you centralize or decentralize? How do you control, how do you not control? Um, how do you have an architecture that allows for independent development by various pieces of your government, by various government agencies, or by various provincial regions in your country? Right, and still have a way for you to integrate that data. Right? So some essential high-level um, or middle-level skills that need to go in. And of course, the third big piece is how do you buy technology effectively? Because it's not buying a car, you're buying the technology over five, seven years. Who's going to maintain it when your government policies change? In the past, when they changed, you issued an instruction. The civil service obeyed. Today, when your government policies change, you issue an instruction, the civil service says, sorry, no can do, my computer system don't work that way. All right? So then you're dependent on whoever it is that provides the computer system for you to make that amendment. So your policies are now dependent on the computer systems. How terrible is that? Right? So how then do you go about um, making that effective so that you can go ahead and implement your policies? Then the rest of it is implementation, project management, maintenance, some of these middle-level middle skills. 
Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about this. We have a national Infocom competency framework. We identified 264 different jobs in different sectors by various people. Uh, we're quite contending about this. Um, we do have uh, a lot of training programs. Um, we have no natural resources. So the only, natural, the only resource we have is manpower. So we spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of energy focused on equipping people with skills. And so we do have a framework. And under this framework, we identify people for 264 different IT jobs. Uh, and that changes from time to time uh, as new technologies come into play. Um, literacy and accessibility. We have no rural population. So people always talk about a rural and urban divide in terms of IT literacy. Um, so I'm going to share with you a story. Um, see, it's not always about the rural and urban divide. When I first started out in IT about 20, 20 plus years ago, um, I worked in the courts. So I was in the civil service for 10, 15 years, about 10 years, uh, in various uh, government ministries. And uh, my first job uh, as an IT engineer was to work the, the worst job in the world, which is the help desk. You know, the guy who's, you know, you call up the guy, he says, you know, my computer doesn't work, can you come and help me? Yeah? Yeah. The guy at the end who says, can you please restart your computer because he doesn't know anything about what's going on, really? Yeah, that was me, right? So um, we started, I started a life in a help desk in the courts, and uh, at the time we had just implemented email. Big deal. Email was a big deal 20 years ago. Never had email ever, right? And um, the senior judge was uh, extremely pleased with it, right? Sent out an email to everybody, all the judges, and says, you know, I uh, want to express my thanks to all the IT guys for putting email and giving us this new uh, tool which helps us to communicate better. So as an IT guy, we helped work it out and you know, do it. Uh, we felt good. All felt good about it. And so two months passed. You know, life was good. Until one day, I received a call from the secretary to a judge. And the secretary said, Joseph, Joseph, can you please come and help me? I need to print out this email, but I can't get the printer to work. So very well, I climbed up the stairs up to the judge's office. And along the way, I was thinking, boy, this must be a really, really important email because the judge needs to print it out and keep it and file it. So uh, when I got there, I fixed the computer and configured everything. And the secretary printed out the email. She took the email, she put it into a paper folder. I've got one over there to show you. Took the email into the judge. The judge looked at the email. He scribbled his response on the piece of paper. The secretary took it back out went outside to the desk, logged in as the judge, and typed the email in. Now, of course, 20 years ago, this, I don't know if people feel uh, a difference. Oh, you know, uh, of course, as an IT guy, I was, I was shocked. I said, that's not how email is supposed to be used. But you see, when we talk about the digital divide, it's not just about the rural and the urban side, because the judge doesn't know how to type. And those of you who have in uh, Commonwealth countries, maybe not here, you will know that actually there's a huge thing called a typing pool where a whole pile of uh, the civil service colleagues will be sitting there with typewriters. We no longer have typewriters today. And they would type out the judges' judgments. Right? So when I share these stories with some of the uh, uh, other uh, participants from some of our classes in different countries, some of them challenged me. Does your judge know the law? Yes. So does it mean that he doesn't know how to need to know how to use an email? You know, does he need to know how to use email? Do your generals know how to use email? This was a question asked to me. Um, actually, in Singapore, the answer is yes. But many people will feel that way. Many people who have been working in the civil service for a large, they'll be uncomfortable with this, right? And so the question is, how then do you address that divide, um, not just between the rural and the urban? population, but between the generations, the younger Facebook generation who are out there in mobile phones, and also the, the, uh, the people who have been, uh, I guess, working for much longer with the right experience, right expertise, how do you close that gap right, and make it so that they are also um, using the technology? So I guess after 30 years, and you know, the only one takeaway I would say is that in implementing this in our journey, we've discovered that it's probably less about the technology and it's probably more about the people. And that's really the hardest thing uh, in getting this to work. That's all. Thank you.